Good evening. My name is uh, Trevor Robbins. I'm actually a Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience and Psychology at the University of Cambridge. And I'm here tonight to introduce the lecture. Now, first of all, mobile phones. The last warning. OK, please turn them off. And I'd like you to remember that the event is being webcast and filmed tonight. And it remains for me to introduce Professor Andrew Bumford to you. So Andrew is a Professor of Conservation Science in the Department of Zoology at the University of Cambridge. His main research interests are in the costs and benefits of effective conservation, quantifying the change in state of nature, identifying efficient conservation responses, and exploring how efforts in conservation may be best reconciled with farming. In order to have the most impact of his work, he clearly interacts in an interdisciplinary way with other research colleagues. He also interacts with farming and also practitioners in other developing countries. So I welcome Andrew to give this talk and I'm sure we're going to have a very informative and enjoyable lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. And thank you very much all for coming on such an inclement night. It's lovely to see so many people. To put it bluntly, nature is in quite serious trouble, and it's our fault. Since the rise of agriculture, we've removed roughly one half of wild habitats and the populations of animals and plants that uh, depend on them. And it seems we're losing what's left at somewhere between a half and 1% per year. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, 87% of all assessed fish stocks are now fully or overexploited. For non-assessed stocks, the situation's apparently worse still. Since 1970, populations of Africa's spectacular mammals, so it's zebras, it's elephants, antelope, have more than halved, and that's inside the parks that have been set up to protect them. Outside, they've often all but disappeared. Overall, we've elevated extinction rates to roughly a thousand times the average background rates at which species disappear from the fossil record, and more than one in five of our fellow species are reckoned to be in danger of extinction in the near to medium future. And things aren't getting any better. 2010 was the year by which the world's governments pledged they would have slowed the rate of biodiversity loss. But as these plots uh, show, forests, seagrass beds and mangroves at the top, these are the only habitats whose extent is tracked at a global scale, have continued to shrink, and the condition of coral reefs isn't getting uh, any better either. The lower plots show trends in uh, different population indices. The most compre comprehensive is the LPI, the Living Planet Index at the bottom. And again, you can see things are generally in sustained decline. Overall, 8 out of 10 of the global indicators of the state of nature, the amount of it, have continued to decline, mostly at the same rate as in the 1990s. And that's really no surprise because all five of the indicators of the pressures that we're putting on natural systems have continued to increase. This grim litany will be all too familiar, I'm sure, and it raises some serious questions that I want to explore. Why is it happening uh, and why does it matter? We live in a world with uh, many other pressing problems that need our attention, so why should the continuing demise of wild places and the creatures that live there be a priority? Again, the arguments I make here will be familiar to most of you. But after that, in the bulk of my talk, I want to do something that you might find surprising. I want to see whether the picture, in fact, might not be quite so unremittingly gloomy and instead consider whether there are any glimmers of hope. So rather than focus solely on nature's decline, I'll examine, albeit in an anecdotal way, some success stories where things are getting better rather than worse. 
And I'll try to see what these examples might say about how to improve the overall success of conservation interventions. And finally, I'll try to assess what all this means about the prospects for nature over the next century or so. Is, rapid, is nature's rapidly draining glass half empty, or is it in any way half full? So turning to my first question, we need to understand what's causing the loss of nature really at two levels. The immediate processes causing things to die out and the underlying drivers behind those processes. Now the gravest of the immediate processes causing things to die out is of course the clearance of wild habitats. One well-documented UK example is Dorset Heathland, which formed the backdrop, really a character, in many of Thomas Hardy's novels. Its decline he was already mourning by the end of the 19th century. This man here is one of my heroes. He's pioneering British conservationist Norman Moore, and in what I think is one of the earliest quantitative analyses of habitat loss, Norman's reconstructed maps showed that Heathland clearance, if anything, accelerated after Hardy's time, especially after World War II, with government grants and afforestation programmes encouraging farming and tree planting, even in areas where low soil fertility meant it was wholly uneconomic. And worldwide, habitat loss uh, at sea as well as on land remains the single greatest threat to nature. Alongside it, we're harvesting uh, and hunting wild populations at a higher rate uh, than they can sustain, and we're spreading very many species to new places uh, where they sometimes eat or outcompete or cause disease uh, in native species. Just one uh, example is the fungus that causes the disease chytridiomycosis. This is thought to be responsible for the extinction of dozens of amphibians over the past 20 years, apparently including these remarkable gastric brooding frogs uh, from eastern Queensland, in which the eggs developed inside uh, their mother's stomachs in a way which will now forever remain only patchily understood. And alongside these well-established threats, new threats are emerging too. Human-driven changes uh, to the climate have been estimated as being likely to commit between a fifth and a third of all species to extinction by 2050. Eutrophication from nitrogen and phosphates originating, originating in uh, fertilisers is bringing about fundamental changes to uh, many low-nutrient lake systems and causing harmful algal blooms uh, in both marine and fresh water. And our emissions of carbon, uh, of carbon dioxide, a quarter of which get absorbed by the sea where they form carbonic acid, are now on such a scale that they're shifting the pH of the ocean's as a whole. Many marine scientists consider that by 2050, seawater may be too acidic for many creatures to build their calcium carbonate shells. So much marine life, from reef-building corals to photosynthetic plankton, might quite literally start to dissolve. What about the underlying drivers behind these threats? Well, to my mind, these come in four main flavours. Most straightforwardly, there's the size of our population. We took almost all of human history to reach the one billion mark. We got there sometime around 1800. We're now growing at around one billion people every 13 years. Even though uh, growth is now slowing, with world population set to peak at around 20 billion, perhaps at around 2050, we're still expanding by the equivalent of the combined populations of Athens and Nairobi, or if you find that scary, the whole of Scotland and Birmingham every single month. I can say that because I'm from Birmingham. Second, there's our unquenchable demand for higher standards of living. That's essential, of course, for much of the world's population, but it's far more questionable among the rest of us. This is even more important, I think, though less comfortable uh, for the comfortably off to contemplate than population growth. Total population is likely to rise by roughly 50% between 2000 and 2050. But per capita consumption is set to grow more than four times. Although the efficiency with which we use resources is growing, it's generally doing so much more slowly than that. So that the impacts of per capita consumption on total consumption still outstrip 
those of growth in the number of people doing the consuming. Then there's the problem that when we make choices, we tend to put ourselves above people elsewhere and above future generations. This is particularly bad news for conservation because the benefits of conserving somewhere are often externalities that accrue mostly to people other than those in charge of an area. And they tend to build up over the long term, so they typically get discounted in favour of more immediate returns today. And last on my list, there's our growing disconnect from nature. We live in a rapidly urbanising society where for the first time more than half of humanity now works and plays and sleeps in towns and cities. In some ways, urbanisation helps restrict our footprint, but it also means we're at risk of losing touch with wild creatures and wild places. Yet how can we be expected to care about what we no longer experience, what we no longer know? Some argue that nature's erosion may ultimately be driven as much by our indifference as by our direct actions. It's worth uh, mentioning briefly uh, why all this matters. In broad terms, there are two main arguments for conservation, for trying to do something. First, there's the argument which I suspect is important for many of us in this room, which says that limiting the loss of nature is simply the right thing to do. We should leave the world in at least no worse a state than we first find it. For some people, that's largely a moral argument. Uh, for others, it's expressed in religious terms. For me, it's about a sense of wonder in nature's marvels. What makes me uh, a passionate conservationist is the desire that uh, my children and yours and theirs in turn can have the same opportunities to learn from and be amazed and humbled by nature as I have. But there are, of course, powerful material arguments for conservation too. We all of us benefit from nature in terms of our immediate well-being through ecosystem services. Sometimes those benefits are relatively obvious. They're the physical goods like fish or timber or medicines that we harvest directly from the wild. But many other ecosystem services are less tangible and easier to ignore because they don't pass through conventional economic markets. So one example would be the role in climate regulation of the great planktonic soup of the world's oceans, much of it living in those pH-sensitive shells. Phytoplankton not only soak up carbon dioxide, but as this immense uh, planktonic buildup off the coast of Alaska shows, they can reflect sunlight back into space, and they even release into the air particles of dimethyl sulphide around which clouds then begin to form. There's increasing evidence, too, of the role of green space in enhancing our physical and psychological uh, well-being. For instance, a recent experiment from the States, which I find absolutely amazing, shows that simply having some pot plants in a room instead of just a desk and a computer significantly changes the relative importance, which in quick surveys of their attitudes, psychology undergraduates, and of course it's always psychology undergraduates in these kinds of studies, the importance which they attach to relationships and community, so family and friends, compared with fame and fortune. Now, estimating the values of these services that we're losing through the erosion of nature is extremely hard. These things are very difficult uh, to value at all precisely, but there's increasing agreement that the cost to society as a whole is very large indeed, with three estimates of uh, the long-term cost of just a single year's loss of nature worldwide all coming in in the trillions of dollars, so in terms of thousands of billions of dollars from each year's loss. Big numbers are all very well, but what do these losses look like on the ground and in human terms? Well, they look like what's been happening in South Asia, where the deregulation of the veterinary drug diclofenac inadvertently caused the poisoning of tens of millions of vultures that feed on dead cattle and are unusually sensitive to diclofenac. That's led to the loss of the free waste disposal service that they provided, a huge build-up of cattle carcasses, grave fears about outbreaks of disease, and even a schism in a world religion, the Parsis, over how to dispose of their dead, as there are now too few vultures to pick over their corpses 
in traditional towers of silence. And the loss of ecosystem services is equally manifest in the southern United States, where decades of drainage have removed tens of thousands of square kilometres of coastal wetlands that used to buffer human settlements from the impacts of hurricanes. This is Katrina uh, just before she made landfall. And in a less dramatic but more widespread way, the loss of those protection services impacts many of us through the long-term rise in the cost of insurance. Earlier this year, Lloyds of London announced record insurance payouts. I'm sure they'll be higher still in 2013. And we all pay more in our premiums as the insurance companies pass on to their customers the costs of escalating damage from storms and floods. So the bad news is that nature is indeed in serious trouble, and one way or another, this is harming all of us. But are there any bits of good news? Places where, despite growing pressures, conservation efforts have meant that the loss of nature has been slowed or even reversed. Maybe understanding and celebrating some successes might help us understand a bit better what they're doing right so that future efforts can score more hits and fewer misses. And besides that reason for thinking positively, I've got a nagging worry that conservationists may to some degree have overlooked the vital importance of convincing people that there are solutions to our situation. We've successfully made people aware of the problems, but we've then given them no prospect that things can be turned around. Just a dismal choice between despair and denial. Maybe conservation is missing a trick. Consider, of all things, Red Nose Day. That raises around £80 million every two years for humanitarian projects, and it's all focused around just one evening. It's worth asking how they do it. I don't know about you, but I don't think much about it until on my way home that evening, some presumably otherwise sane individual dressed up for the day as a rabbit accosts me for my small change. But after getting home and, and watching a couple of hours of amusing TV sketches interspersed with a heart-rending plea or two, I've picked up the phone and I've pledged the family silver, or at least I've pledged my son's pocket money for the next year. <laughs> Why? Well, I think that's because the format immediately follows desperately moving films about AIDS victims or street children with uplifting sequences showing me where my money went last time, showing me that something can be done, that my contribution can make a difference. And maybe telling good news as well as bad news makes sense for conservation too. And the good news is that despite all I've been saying, there are a growing number of conservation successes. Going back uh, to the Dorset Heathlands, 20 years after Norman Moore documented their sustained decline, attitudes to the environment had changed. Government had by now decided that public access and enjoyment were more important, more, more important priorities than unprofitable plantations. And so its foresters began working with conservationists to return large areas of conifers back into heathland. Trees were removed, seeds that were long dormant in the seed bank started to germinate, birds, insects and reptiles spread out from the tiny fragments that uh, Norman's uh, foresight had uh, managed to save. And as a result, Norman Moore, who was perhaps the first person to chart the decline of a habitat, has lived uh, long enough and worked hard enough to see his curve of loss just starting to tilt upwards. And so, prompted by uh, the comic relief bunny and spurred on by the example of the Dorset Heathlands, I started trying to put together a whole book about conservation successes. I asked friends to send me uh, their good news stories and eventually catalogued dozens of them. And then, to find out more, to check they really were as good as they seemed and to learn about what made them work, I got a grant from the Leverhulme Trust and picked a handful to go and visit. In Kaziranga National Park in Assam, I met with a poacher on the run and literally in fear of his life. I met the rangers chasing him and I met the local villagers. Between them, they explained how very traditional 
so-called fortress and finds conservation involving frequent gun battles between park rangers uh, and armed poaching gangs, but coupled crucially with local people's exceptional cultural tolerance of large and dangerous animals, have together worked to protect and dramatically increase a highly vulnerable population of Indian rhinos in the face of very lucrative poaching, despite the area being politically unstable and despite the park having more than 70,000 very poor people living on its immediate doorstep. In extreme western Ecuador, I learnt from a talismanic village elder called Don Alejandro Ramirez how local people there finally brought to an end 50 years of clearance of hilltop forests that in about 70 square kilometres are home to over 70 narrowly distributed so-called restricted range bird species. And that's more than three times as many of these high priority species as the whole of Europe, North Africa and the Middle East put together in just 70 square kilometres. But the villagers conserved their forests not because of conventional conservation arguments that the area is biologically extraordinary. For over a decade, this approach had failed. They did so instead because a lateral thinking ecologist called Dusty Becker had looked at what the forests did for the local people. Working with them, she discovered that during the dry season, they play a vital role in intercepting fog, known as garua, that rolls in off the Pacific Ocean. Regardless of the altitude uh, or the side of the mountain on which she uh, placed her gauges, she found that they caught far more moisture in intact forest than they did in the fields or pasture uh, that were replacing it. And hence, the forests were acting as an essential source of dry season water for downstream farmers. Soon after seeing the data, the villagers declared 1,000 hectares of their land as an ecological reserve. So what conventional conservation exhortations failed to achieve in more than a decade, the focus on fog delivered in less than three months. In the Netherlands, I found out about that country's extraordinary plans, which are still more or less on track, to return one-sixth of its land surface to nature by creating new habitats, taking down dikes, restoring natural floodplains, linking all the components together through a network of corridors, even building so-called eco-ducts across motorways uh, so that uh, animals on one side of uh, these kind of uh, barriers can cross safely to the other side. If you want to see these for yourself, go on Google Earth and fly along any major trunk route in the Netherlands and sooner or later you'll come across these colossal green bridges uh, cutting across them. The entire enterprise is terribly expensive. It's costing around a billion euros a year, but it's survived successive changes of government because politicians are consistently persuaded that despite its cost, it's actually very good value for money, not just in terms of the benefits for wildlife, but because of its benefits for people. Land under nature soaks up carbon. It stores flood water and so prevents damage to infrastructure. And it provides space in a country where the number one health problem is recognised as stress, space where people can relax and unwind. The penultimate story I want to talk about comes from Western Australia. Here, the world's largest deposit of bauxite, uh, which is the ore we ultimately get aluminium from, unfortunately lies underneath almost the whole of a very unusual and highly species-rich eucalypt system called Jarrah Forest. The problem is that the only way to mine bauxite is to clear fell the forest, take off the topsoil, and then cart away the rock. In 1961, when Alcoa, the biggest bauxite company in the region, won its 84-year concession, all that it was legally required to do was then put the topsoil back on, bung in a few native saplings, and walk away. That, of course, didn't work. They blew over uh, in the first storm. But legally, that was no problem. Quite remarkably, though, and way ahead of their time, this was the late 1960s, early 70s, Alcoa recognised that what really mattered for the long-term security of their lease was not what the law said now, but what people would think about what they did in 20 or 30 years' time. So they hired psychologists 
and market researchers who told them that was likely to be, of all things, the environment. If Alcoa didn't pay attention to that, they could lose their highly profitable concession no matter how lax the formal legal terms of their agreement. And so they decided, quite simply, to become the best mine restoration operation in the world. They spent many millions of dollars to find out how best to store and return the topsoil and the seed bank that it contained, how to harvest extra seeds before clearance and sow them afterwards, how to clone dozens of species that are reluctant to germinate from seeds. They did groundbreaking work on limiting the spread of a fungal dieback disease. To combat the continued rise of alien foxes and cats, they imported a giant Italian sausage-making machine to manufacture millions of irresistible but poisonous salamis and chipolatas, which they then airdrop with GPS-guided precision across thousands of square kilometres of regrowing forest. The results are extraordinarily impressive. Alcoa is now re-establishing Jara at the same rate as they're clearing it. Uh, this shows what it looks like. Uh, twen- this shows the same scene 20 years after it looked uh, like that. And they got to the stage uh, by 2001 that the number of plant species uh, in their post-restoration plots relative to the number in the same plots before clearance began, uh, began to exceed 100%. They were getting more species in their plots after restoration than were present before they cleared the forest. And all that achieved not by a conservation organisation, without a penny of conservation money, but by one of the biggest mining corporations in the world. My last example comes from the sea, uh, and it again illustrates the power of people working outside conventional conservation. It involves, of all things, a tuna fishery. Albacore is a medium-sized open ocean predator, and like other tuna, it's vulnerable to being overfished through fishing methods like long lining, purse seining, and illegal high seas drift netting. But one small fishery based out of the west coast of the United States, which calls itself the American Albacore Fisheries Association, or AFA, still uses traditional methods of trolling, uh, which involves uh, a short line, and poling, where single fish are caught on rods. These methods, unlike the others, are highly selective. They catch only a small portion of each shoal that's encountered, and there's essentially zero bycatch of non-target species. Like many other uh, fisheries, it's also quite dangerous. It involves going out for many weeks into the middle of the Pacific in boats that are just 60 foot uh, long. And when you finally find a shoal, then standing in your waist, up to your waist, uh, in uh, a mesh basket uh, at the back of the boat uh, in a pitching sea, and carefully catching and then throwing over your shoulder seven or eight kilogram fish uh, at the rate of up to 10 a minute, very carefully trying not to hit the person uh, next door. I was really keen when I went to meet the fishermen of Afa to go out and see this in action, and they took one look at me and said, no, we don't think that's a good idea, you might not come back. (laughs) So that's tricky enough, but the real problem for the fishermen of Afa is that they've been undercut in the American canned tuna market by the large quantities of tuna being offloaded uh, by unsustainable long-lining and purse-seining boats. And as a result, they've seen the prices they get for their fish plummeting, and they've fast been going out of business. That was until 2007, when, after a lengthy process of independent assessment, a remarkable initiative called the Marine Stewardship Council certified the AFA fishery as being sustainably managed. So AFA products can now carry the MSC certification label, and AFA fishermen can get premium prices for their fish by selling them to conservation-conscious retailers in Europe. This is only, of course, one small fishery, but it's one of 300 now certified or being assessed by the MSC, which seems to be making a difference, not just in conservation terms, but in human terms as well. As one third generation AFA fisherman said to me, at long last, there's some hope that we have a future and that my son can go into fishing and carry on the family tradition. Those then are brief examples of good news stories. Of course... Like all the case studies that I visited, these successes are not certain. Some 
may well fall apart. They've all got limitations and wrinkles, which for me was what made them especially interesting. And they're unrepresentative of conservation as a whole. They're the result of very deliberate cherry picking. But although they may be in the minority, many conservation projects do succeed. Each dot uh, on this map is a success story that I looked at in one way or another uh, for my book. And of course, there are very many uh, others. One very recent one being collaborative work of many organisations in tackling the crisis facing South Asia's, Asia's vultures uh, that I mentioned earlier, where after an unprecedented four-nation agreement to ban diclofenac, combined with uh, the provision of vulture restaurants providing safe meat, scientists are now just starting to see the devastating uh, decline beginning uh, to be uh, reversed. Bear in mind that this is a logarithmic scale, so you can see how dramatic that decline uh, was. So what, between them, do all these success stories uh, tell us? Well, first, they show that conservation can work. That's not to say that it usually does. I think most conservation interventions are less successful than this. Some are outright failures. But many do succeed. And that success clearly isn't confined to one particular set of favourable conditions or tractable problems. I chose many of my stories specifically because they appeared to be making headway despite unpromising situations. They were expanding space for nature in an already crowded country like the Netherlands or curbing lucrative poaching in a desperately poor land plagued by stop-start armed insurrection. Second, the successes I've looked at illustrate how conservation itself is, of course, diversifying. From traditional preservation of nature for its own sake, as with Kaziranga's rhinos, to securing sustained harvests of wild-caught goods, and through to safeguarding and restoring healthy ecosystems because of other less tangible benefits that they provide, like more, nat more water when it's, wet, when it's dry, sorry, less risk of flooding when it's wet, uh, or space where people can simply relax. And the cast of those involved in conservation has correspondingly broadened too, beyond just rangers and lawyers and scientists, to include farmers, planners, engineers, and in many cases consumers and corporations. Conservation is slowly becoming mainstreamed. Third, in conservation, one size does not fit all. So while a bottom-up, community-driven approach was obviously pivotal to progress in Loma Alta, Kaziranga reinforces the point that Asia's rhinos survive nowhere without armed protection and strong enforcement of the law. And likewise, while government has been an essential driving force for change in the Netherlands, success in Alcoa's mines and in the American Albacore fleet has been achieved almost entirely through a combination of private enterprise and NGO pressure. From what I've seen, those who advocate on ideological grounds, this or that singular approach to conservation risk narrowing the opportunities for it to succeed. Last, even though the examples I've looked at are pretty varied, there are a number of themes that are repeatedly associated with success. So nearly all the stories I learnt about involved taking a long-term uh, view, hanging on despite setbacks, and recognising that success requires both time and adequate funding. Regrowing complex forests or reinstating nature across a crowded country are things that don't come quickly or cheap. Several projects, like Loma Alta, were apparently helped by operating in communities with fair and transparent ways of reaching decisions. While many depended on having a strong regulatory and legislative framework for conservation, which itself was often the product of sustained lobbying by politically savvy NGOs. Many of the successes I visited worked in part because they dared to think big. Their proponents dreamed of a nature network spanning a whole country, of a restored forest every bit as rich as what went before, or of a certification scheme, in the case of the Marine Stewardship Council, that might one day extend to one-fifth 
of all the world's wild-caught wild fish. Many showed the power of a Goldilocks-sized portion of relevant research. So not so much science uh, for it to be an excuse to delay action. We've all seen that. But enough to identify a problem, diagnose its likely cause, suggest an intervention, and then monitor and, if necessary, uh, change that intervention. Just about all the efforts I looked at have their flaws. The measures needed to save Kaziranga's rhinos raise real concerns about the human costs of protection. The evidence of the MSC's effects on fish stocks is pretty patchy, and many projects suffer uh, from a lack of real monitoring. Conservation must always be self-critical and strive to do better. However, it seems to me that improving things as you go along is very different to not starting them at all because they're not perfect. Every story I visited succeeded in no small measure because of remarkable leaders. Long-sighted individuals like Norman Moore in Dorset, who foresaw a different world where concerns for nature and calls for its conservation would grow. Independent thinkers like Dusty Becker, the researcher at the heart of the Fog story. Key early adopters like her colleague Dan Alejandro, so pioneers uh, in villages, but also in businesses uh, and in government. And energetic and inspiring doers who took on daunting tasks and made things work. And last, many of these architects thought creatively. Rather than focusing solely on the difficulties facing threatened creatures uh, and places, they looked at the challenges facing ordinary people. What mattered to them? How could their problems be addressed? And by taking this broader view, these pioneers found new ways around seemingly intransigent problems. Conservation needs all the friends it can get. And broad imaginative thinking, using among other things the insights came from recognising the importance of ecosystem services, seems a powerful way of finding them. So what does all this mean uh, for the future? Is there a chance that most of the extraordinary fabric of the living world could persist? Or is nature's continued demise utterly unavoidable? Well, from what I've seen, a great deal of nature could be saved. But whether it will be depends on how much we want it and on the decisions that we make over the next quarter century. Looked at objectively, the situation is extremely serious. The threats I started off talking about are grave and growing. New challenges are emerging and they're interacting uh, with one another. And on top of that, we can expect the unexpected, non-linear changes in the way that natural systems respond to increasing pressures. Like most conservationists I've asked, I think we have at most one generation left to turn things around. With about half of wild nature already gone, roughly 1% of the remainder being cleared, caught or displaced each year, I reckon that in a couple of decades from now, the unravelling will have become irreparable. To stop this, we already have a pretty good idea about the sorts of conservation interventions which will be required on the ground. Nature reserves that are bigger, better connected and better protected. Much greater self-restraint in how we exploit forests, fisheries and increasingly the world's dwindling supplies of fresh water. Far more serious efforts to limit the spread of invasive species and drastic reining in of our greenhouse gas and reactive nitrogen emissions. I think these sorts of changes in the way we treat the environment won't happen or be sustained without much more fundamental transformations in how we live our lives. Having fewer children, especially in richer countries, where individuals consume so much more. Greatly reducing our use of fossil fuels. In wealthier countries, seriously lowering our consumption of meat and dairy goods so that the food that we need can be grown on less land. Curbing our seemingly insatiable appetite for ever more stuff, the latest fashions and the shiniest gizmos. 
Mortgaging the planet's future to meet basic human needs is one thing, but doing it so that we can consume yet more trivia is something else. And most difficult but fundamental of all, I believe we need to replace the prevailing global model of indefinite resource-based economic growth. This may have been tenable in the 19th and early 20th centuries when one could, be, one could be forgiven for thinking that the Earth's resources were boundless. But to con continue clinging to that idea in today's so evidently finite world seems to me to be desperately unimaginative. These are major changes that challenge our core values and expectations that are unsettling even to contemplate. If they happen at all, they'll take time. But I can think of three reasons for still remaining at least somewhat optimistic. The first is that these changes are also essential for tackling the two other great crises of our age. Human-driven changes in the global climate and the wretched poverty of many in the developing world. If we're to succeed on climate change, on poverty or in conservation then we have to tackle their common root causes. Second, while nature is in very serious trouble, roughly half of it still remains. Nature's glass is more or less half full. And that gives us time. Not much time, but a little bit. And third, the places and people I've been lucky enough to encounter have convinced me that we already have both the wit and the will to slow down nature's loss very considerably. We know some of the things that need to be done to increase the success rate of conservation efforts so that there are more hits and fewer misses. And often, more often than we might think, the will is there too. Whether that's the Assamese people's tolerance of Kaziranga's rhinos or the Dutch politicians' recognition that nature conservation is not just for the birds but is good for people too. So I don't think nature's unrelenting decline is inevitable. Conservation does not run counter to the wider economic interests of society at large. Alcoa isn't going bust. The Dutch National Ecological Network hasn't damaged the Netherlands' credit rating. Instead, conservation enriches rather than diminishes the human enterprise. And there's still an enormous amount of late nature left to fight for. Thank you very much for listening. So I'd like to thank you, Andrew, for this very valuable lecture on a topic which affects us all and for your visionary, upbeat, and also pragmatic perspectives on it. Now, we're going to have some discussion, and I'm sure you're willing yep. to take some questions from the audience. So, questioners, could they please um, address their remarks to the microphone, from our microphonists who are patrolling the auditorium, and stand up and, and also say their name if they wish. So, questions, please. Yes, there, please, that lady, that lady there. Thank you. You mentioned one of the major problems was um, population growth, and yet it seems to be politically incorrect to really bring that point home to the global population. And when anyone does, it's always rather timidly about how the West should have... people in the West should have less children. But I think it's a global problem. Even if you copy all these... Um, suggestions here and they're successful it can't keep up with population growth I would think uh, that's a very good point and um, that's why I put it up it's one of the four main drivers I think it's crucial it's extremely important um, there are some signs that population growth is slowing the world's uh, the, the UN uh, population divisions forecasts uh, for 2050 suggest uh, that at some time around then uh, world population uh, will reach a ceiling. There's lots of uncertainty about that. But for the first time in the last uh, decade or so, we've reached a position where um, 
I think virtually nobody is suggesting that world population will double again, and that hasn't happened before. So there are some uh, promising signs. The key uh, to much of that in developing countries seems to be uh, about empowering, educating and empowering women. Uh, when they're educated, it seems as though that's a much better predictor of uh, population growth rates, for example, uh, than uh, economic growth. That seems a far weaker predictor of uh, when population growth slows. So I agree it's extremely uh, important. I would just underscore, though, uh, that it's especially important in, developing, developed, in the developed world uh, and among the middle classes in developing countries because we consume uh, so much uh, more. So uh, it was a few years ago, but a um, reasonable statistic uh, was that uh, we consume in the U people in the U.S., but the figure won't be terribly different for the EU, consume roughly, a, roughly as many resources in their lifetime as 500 people from the African state of Mali. So I know where I'm most worried about population growth. Yes, please, that gentleman there with the beard. Could you stand up, please, as well? Yeah. How many of them were made possible or were dependent on charitable donations? That's a good question. Um, so the Kazaranga project is, um, to a large degree, dependent on those. Uh, the Dutch National Ecological Network is about 50-50 government funding uh, and a big lottery scheme. Whether you call that charitable or not, it's, it's a lottery for nature, so it's directly targeted. Um, uh, the uh, uh, example uh, in Alcoa uh, and uh, the example of the AFA fishery, those are uh, entirely uh, paid for out of the private sector and don't rely on charitable donations, although, of course, the Marine Stewardship Council is a charity and is itself supported in its work by charities. So to some degree that's true, uh, but to a large degree there's public and private uh, sector finance in there as well. I can discuss more, but uh, <laughs> and go through each of the little points in the break if you want. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for that, by the way. Um, one of the key things that you said there is that conservation requires a certain amount of time and ongoing funding over a large period of time. One of the problems to me seems to be that there is a lack of long-term thinking with funders tends to be that a majority of these projects are only being funded over a period of about three years. How can we fix that major problem if we're going to solve some of these issues in conservation, um, the short-term ones? I think you're absolutely right. Um, many projects, many of the projects I looked at succeeded because uh, they'd been going for a long time. They'd faced setbacks um, at some stages. They were, they, th 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 you could have classed them as failing. And uh, if they'd only got short-term uh, funding available, then that would have been the end of them, and yet they turn things around. So, uh, yes, I'm convinced from those that long-term funding is essential in many situations. Not all, but in many situations. How you persuade funders to do that is something different. I think one of the things that can be uh, helped uh, is uh, through monitoring of results as they go along. So I mentioned that was, uh, as I saw it, a fault of some of these projects. Uh, some of them don't have that much monitoring in place, uh, yet my view is that that's important for two reasons. One, to see whether you're actually doing what you think you're doing and, and tweak what you're doing if it isn't working, but also in terms of providing positive feedback to funders so they can see that they're getting what, they're, what, what, they, what they hope to be paying for. And uh, so, uh, so, so they're more likely to sustain funding uh, in, in, into the medium term. Uh, another model which is can be important there is uh, through certain organisations, some NGOs, for example, RSPB springs to mind, which as a result of having um, uh, a funding base driven largely by members rather than by uh, grants, it's able to uh, buffer the fashions uh, and the short-term thinking perhaps of, uh, of, uh, of some donors uh, and indeed government, and so invest in things over the long term based on a vision that it's worked out for itself. So I think that's a useful funding model for an organisation. Of course, it's not necessarily that easy to be replicated. I don't have any silver bullets, I'm afraid. A question right at the back, please. Can you stand? Thank you. 
What can we as individuals do to help? What so, can we as individuals do to help? Uh, lots and lots of things. Um, so uh, there's loads of stuff that uh, anybody uh, can do. So put simply, you can send money to conservation organisations. Most of the ones that I know do a really good job with that. That's a great investment. Uh, you can tell politicians uh, what you think, what's important to you when they come around and ask for your vote. If the environment's important to you, ask what they're doing for it or what they're not. You can reduce your own consumption uh, as much as possible. Uh, you can think about things like travelling less, like uh, perhaps altering uh, your diet a bit. Uh, you can offset uh, the remaining costs that you impose on the environment. You can pay your carbon taxes. Uh, we paid for all of the travel involved in this book through a fantastic conservation programme in South Africa that's regrowing carbon at the same time as restoring habitat uh, for rhinos. Uh, you can uh, go out into nature as much as possible. And crucially, I think, uh, if you're already an enthusiast for nature, take other people who aren't yet, particularly kids. Um, so that's a few things you can do. Another question right at the back, and then you, sir, afterwards. So um, I'm not sure exactly how many million years ago, but um, the carbon dioxide concentration of the air was much greater than today. And it actually came together with a much more luscious environment, so much hotter climate. And I just wondered what your view on that, because everybody's worried about how much carbon dioxide there is in the air. But actually, we've had times in nature, minus human beings to pollute it, when carbon dioxide at a 10 times concentration was not a problem. So you make an interesting point. Um, I think uh, I'd respond in a couple of ways. Uh, one is that uh, I've no doubt that quite a lot of nature will survive climate change and that uh, if we don't... Um, alter what we're doing and are somehow able to come back in 10,000 years' time, there will be, still be quite a lot of diversity on Earth, and in a few million years' time, it may be recovering. Uh, and that's great, um, but it won't much help us. And in that context, I think it's really important to bear in mind that uh, while that may have been true uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, um, our own systems, particularly our food production system, uh, have uh, only been developed during a phase of... Um, uh, unusual stability in Earth systems uh, at uh, lower temperatures and with far lower carbon dioxide concentrations. We have no confidence, and I, uh, uh, I, I, I understand agricultural scientists have rather limited confidence, that our, our food supply systems, for example, um, can persist in the face of those changes. So things will be around, for sure, in a few million years' time. It would just be nice if in a few hundred years' time our ancestors, our, our children's children were around to enjoy that, to enjoy that too. Uh, there's a gentleman in the green shirt there first and then the gentleman in the grey suit at the back. Yes, th thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, one of the things that struck me listening to you was that all, I think, of the heroes of the pieces you described uh, are traditional villains. Uh, so politicians, uh, villagers... Uh, fishermen, um, mining companies. Would you um, go so far as to say, then, that conservationists have uh, failed and uh, capitalists, God help us, um, have perhaps succeeded? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprisingly. No, many of the heroes weren't. They were conservationists um, who uh, were tenacious or who thought in imaginative ways and were able to see how their interests as conservationists potentially al aligned uh, for different, different sorts of reasons with a whole host of other actors, um, some of whom were capitalists, but some of whom weren't. Um, uh, uh, and, and so to me, the smart money is on that kind of broad uh, imaginative thinking, that kind of uh, lateral thinking, as I described, a sort of ability to th see a problem that you care about because of the, the creatures that live there, but to see that through the eyes of the people whose behaviour needs to change uh, if you're going to resolve that situation. So I think you need to work with those people. Very often those people will become your heroes, but um, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, conservation, uh, conservationists were key to uh, 
just about all of those successes. Yes, sir, at the back, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Craddock Williams. I live and work in Kampala, Uganda. Can I ask, uh, please, whether your precepts are applicable globally, or do you think that the uh, trade-off between economic advantage and uh, ecological advantage always have to be worked out locally in respect to the particular situations that arise? So I used to um, live and work in Uganda myself um, uh, in uh, forest uh, and other systems there. Um, I think uh, there is an emerging generality which is um, not universally true but um, is uh, to a first approximation uh, on average the case that remaining uh, wild systems probably generate greater benefit on the average to society as a whole. I mean, economic, measured in economic terms, rather than for not, not short, not immediate financial terms, but in broad, long-term economic terms, um, to society as a whole if they're left intact than if they're converted to other land uses. Um, we've already lost um, half of uh, natural systems. The remaining ones are increasingly valuable. We're increasingly farming uh, or fishing or whatever systems that are less profitable. So I think at some point those two lines cross over. On average, I suspect, we're close to that crossover point. That's not to say that that's the case in every instance. Of course, it varies uh, locally uh, depending on uh, the, value, the values of a, of a system uh, left intact and the alternative values to which it may be, may, may be put. So the, so the reality will vary widely uh, locally, and I think one of the keys for people like myself who work on ecosystem services, one of the key challenges for us to do is to provide means for decision makers to get that, the information that's locally relevant rather than have to rely on global generalities. Thank you. Other questions? Jess here, gentleman in the blue jersey. Uh, thanks. My name is Joe Ball. I'm a conservation scientist as well, though not as um, prestigious as yourself, obviously. <laughs> um, thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it. I utterly agree with you about the concept of a need for more optimism in nature conservation. Um, I thought it was interesting, though, that the talk itself was, in some parts, quite sombre. And, in fact, interesting that you used a black colour scheme for the entire thing. I thought it said <laughs> a lot about the, uh, the state of the world. In particular, the slide you talked about some solutions you know, dealing with overpopulation, reducing resource use, reducing consumption, all these kind of things. Um, is there any way that those messages can be made attractive or appealing to people? I mean, I think that's one of the key things that we need to somehow sort out. That's a very good point. Uh, not about the black slides, that's just because I thought they looked nice. <laughs> <isn't they? laughs> um, and it's a hangover from when you have white slides and you used to get bits of fluff on them. So... <laughs> um, so you're right, and those bottom, those, the, the bottom points on that slide were really, th th those are the really difficult ones, and I think they're all going to be challenging because they um, raise fundamental questions about what we think of as a good life, about what our entitlements are, perhaps. Um, and so they're going to be difficult for all of us um, to deal with. I think there are uh, ways of um, considering those from a, um, put it, framing those in a positive, uh, positive way. Obviously, people make positive decisions when given the chance and the opportunities to have fewer children. Uh, that's what happens when, uh, for example, uh, uh, women in developing countries often, when, they, when they're given the chance to control their own family sizes. So that's a positive. Uh, in terms of uh, consuming less uh, trivia, um, to me that's a, that can be framed in terms of thinking about really what makes you happy. And it's not more stuff. Uh, once you've got to a certain level of sufficiency, it's much more, I mean, the psychologists will, will, will tell us this, it's much more about relationships, uh, family, friends, uh, and so on, uh, than it is about stuff. So addressing that is about questioning uh, the, uh, the messages we're fed by current, the current system about what makes us happy and asking some real questions about that and, and taking that back. So I think some of those things can be, but I think some of those things are going to be really difficult. We've... Um, they are, those things are valuable to us as people, uh, and uh, there's an enormous uh, set of forces trying to f continue to feed us um, that, those kind of messages. So it's going to be difficult. 
One final question at the front. Can you stand up, please? Uh, Ray Ward, a concerned citizen. Uh, I qualified for my old age pension last month, and uh, so I'm 65. And this is the second decade of the third millennium and the 21st century, and those are significant facts. Because if I'd taken any notice of the prophets of doom whom I've heard throughout my life, I would have thought that uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we'd either all be dead, or be irradiated, or starving, or crammed into this room like sardines, or perhaps under several feet of water because the ice caps would have melted, which was confidently predicted in the 1950s, I remember, or alternatively that we'd be under several feet of ice because uh, whenever I hear anyone say global warming, I think about 40 years ago, scientists were predicting a new ice age, weren't they? Yes, indeed, they were. People deny it now, but I lived through it, and I know it's true. The Huxley brothers, Julian and Aldous, around 1960, pointed with horror to the fact that world population was about 3 billion and was expected to double to 6 billion by the end of the century. And this was utterly unsustainable. And... We, and uh, we well past double that now, and we still seem to be managing. Yes, it may be the case that we've got 10 years to save the planet, but I seem to remember people saying that 10 years ago, and 20 years ago, and 30 years ago, so and 40 years question? ago. So what is your question? I think my question is, uh, we've managed so far, I think we'll manage in the future at any rate as far as I'm likely to see. Thank you. <laughs> if I can add a cynical note. Thank well, you. I can respond. Please, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I do understand those concerns, and those, I've heard that argument, um, like many of us in this room, uh, many times. I think the situation nowadays is rather different. I think climate change has an extraordinary consensus of, um, science, of science behind it. Uh, I don't know anything else where scientists agree to that extraordinary degree about what's happening um, to our world. Uh, so I don't think we can be sanguine about that. In the past, and I've, I've, I can remember arguments, for instance, by Paul Ehrlich about um, the uh, probabilities of us running out of certain key resources in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years, and he was wrong. And the reasons that he was wrong were that... Um, those resources were ones, whilst quite important, that weren't absolutely essential for uh, our, uh, our well-being. They weren't that well known, and people have found more of them. Nowadays, we're talking about resources in this sort of analysis, like uh, an atmosphere that we can grow our crops in, or a sea uh, that, uh, that coral reefs can grow in, uh, or uh, in, enough land area or enough fresh water to feed ourselves. And our handle on those uh, numbers is much better than it was in the past. And those all seem to be pointing in a, in, in a fairly consistent direction. That's in terms of our own well-being, and I take that very seriously as a, as a father. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, the, the situation is, is starker still if you were to look at it from the perspective of most of the other millions of creatures with which we share the planet, uh, with which I have no doubt as a conservation scientist, those numbers, one-fifth... Um, on their way out. Um, those numbers are um, pretty well correct. There's some uncertainty, but they're pretty well correct. Um, and uh, if anything, uh, they, they look set to, to, to get worse as we uh, increase our understanding of what's happening. So I don't think this is um, crying wolf. I think this is uh, an extremely serious challenge uh, for all of us. Well, on that note... And I'd like to thank you again for an engrossing lecture to a, a rapt audience. And finally, I should note that there is a book uh, by Andrew that's recently been published by the University of Chicago Press, Wild Hope, and it describes many of the good news scenarios that we've heard about tonight and more. It is available at a special discounted price, the royalties of which will go into conservation projects and Andrew himself will be here to sign any books people may wish to purchase.
So good evening and thank you for attending this wonderful lecture.